My name is uh, Timothy Hopp. Uh, I'm uh, one of the instructors for the Open Classroom series. Uh, if you were here last week, uh, you heard myself and Professor Matt uh, speak um, on the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, we really were just a warm-up act for the, uh, the main band tonight. <laughs> that was going to talk about uh, Obamacare, healthcare reform in the U.S., and also the Massachusetts experience. So before I, I introduce uh, our speakers, um, I just want to put a plug in. Uh, this is the open classroom. How many people were here last week? Wow, that's great. Okay, fantastic. So um, we have a good uh, conting contingent uh, group here, uh, constituency. So this, for those of you uh, that this is the first time, uh, this is something um, that, frankly, I'm New Northeastern. Uh, I think this is a really exciting thing to do. Um, Joan Fitzgerald over there, who's the uh, dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, uh, I know has been a driving force in this whole concept of the open classroom. Uh, last semester, um, it was done. The series was on climate change. Uh, this semester, you know, she she was really felt that healthcare would be a great topic because of the implementation of health reform, and, and it is. Um, so it, it's a great opportunity for us to really um, have a discussion in sort of an intellectual way between, you know, those of us on the campus, uh, those of you in the community, uh, and really talk about some, some interesting healthcare issues that are on the, the front burner. So I've put a plug in for, if you go on the course website, you can see the schedule for the rest of the semester. We have some really good speakers coming in, uh, some really uh, top-notch uh, names. Uh, and we're going to be doing, I think, you know, really the, the front burner topics. Um, so uh, I hope you can make every one and uh, tell your friends, uh, bring a friend or two, and uh, we'll, we'll be in great shape. So with that, this week, uh, the title of the, of the series is The Promises and Pitfalls of Obamacare. Um, I guess I, too, now have bought into calling it Obamacare. Uh, for the longest time, I, I didn't want to call it that, but, but it, that seems to be the brand now that it, it has. So, um, and that's fine. But uh, our, our speakers tonight, two very distinguished uh, individuals, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do both of their introductions now, um, and and then they'll come up obviously one at a time and, and do their talk, and then we'll leave enough time. We'll take a five minute break and leave enough time, plenty of time for questions. Uh, so our first speaker is John McDonough. And John McDonough is a professor of public health practice at the Harvard School of Public Health. And he's also director of the new uh, Harvard School of Public Health Center for Public Health Leadership. Uh, most recently, he was the Joan H. Tisch Distinguished Fellow in Public Health at Hunter College in New York City. Between 2008 and 2010, he served as a senior advisor <coughs> on national health reform to the US Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Between 2003 and 2008, he served as executive director of Healthcare for All, which is Massachusetts' leading consumer health advocacy organization, where he played a key role in passage and implementation of the 2006 Massachusetts Health Reform Law. From 1998 through 2003, he was an associate professor at the Heller School at Brandeis University. And from 1985 to 1997, he served as a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, where he co-chaired the Joint Committee on Healthcare. His articles have appeared in Health Affairs, great top health policy journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, and other journals. He has written three books, uh, Inside National Health Reform, published in September 2011, uh, Experiencing Politics, A Legislator's Stories of Government and Healthcare, by the University of California Press and Millbank Fund in 2000, and also Interests, Ideas, and Deregulation, The Fate of Hospital Rate Setting, uh, which was published in 1998. And he received his doctorate in public health in 1996 from the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. And he has a master's in public administration from the JFK School of Government at Harvard, which he uh, obtained in 1990. That's our first speaker. Okay, our second speaker is John Auerbach. John Auerbach is the distinguished professor <coughs> of practice and director of the Institute on Urban Health Research here at Northeastern University. John's area of expertise is public health policy and practice. He served as the Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts from 2007 to 2012, and as the Executive Director of the Boston Public Health Commission from 1997 to 2007. 
and as the state's leading AIDS government official during the early years of the ep epidemic. So for those of you who've lived in Boston for a while, you certainly will know John's work. Uh, he has worked at local, state, and national levels to develop policies and programs to address racial and ethnic disparities, to promote wellness, to combat infectious and chronic disease, and to support the successful implementation of healthcare reform. John was the president of the Association of State and Territories Health Officials and a board member of the National Association of County and City Health Officials. I would say as a Northeastern faculty member, I think we're extremely lucky to have him on our faculty. Uh, and I would say to both of these gentlemen that it's really a pleasure to have two people on the panel with such a rich mix of both academic uh, and practical applied experience around healthcare. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to the first John, John McDonough. Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Thanks to Northeastern. Thanks to all of our many hosts. And uh, it's an honor to be here with John Arbach, who is just such an exceptional, exceptional public health commissioner for Boston and from Massachusetts for so many years. So I'm here in about 40 minutes or so to try to help you understand the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. <laughs> and what I like to do is start out with just a couple of questions. I've actually added a third question, so. And they're multiple choice. Uh, but everybody has to answer. So the first question is this. First question is, how well do you believe that you understand the Affordable Care Act? And you have three choices. A, I know so much about it, I wish I could forget a lot of what I've learned. B, I sort of know it, but don't ask me to stand up in front of a group and explain it. And C, I really don't know it too well at all. Okay? So, A, a whole lot. Oh, boy. <laughs> B, sort of, kind of. Okay? And C, not too well at all. Okay, so a lot more B's than C's, but you know, but a fair number of C's. Uh, second, on balance, how do you feel about this law? A, on balance, I'm happy it's law. B, on balance, I'm unhappy it's law. Or C, I'm still trying to make up my mind. Okay, so A, on balance, happy. Okay, B, on balance, unhappy. Okay, and C, still trying to decide. And, and let, let me just one other thing, I haven't asked this question, I always ask those other two. But from what you've heard, from what you've read, from what you perceive going on, in general, how do you feel like the implementation of the law is going? So A, on balance, I think it's going pretty well, all things considered. B, on balance, I think it's a train wreck. Or C, I'm really confused and don't really, I'm not clear about how well it's going. So A, it's going okay. B, it's a train wreck. Okay, C, trying to figure it out. Okay, so more confusion. All right. So let me just be clear. My goal here is not to try to convince you that it's good or bad. I'm not here to try to convince you that it's wonderful or horrible. I'm here to try to help you understand it and to give you a framework so that you can be more informed as you watch the continued unfolding and implementation of the law. That's my goal. So if you come out of here and you feel like, wow, for the first time I really feel like I got my arms around what this law actually is, then I feel like I will have uh, done what I came here to do and that you'll be better off for it, I hope, anyway. So here we go, all right? So let's dive, I like to treat the law, I try like to treat Obamacare, the Eight Affordable Care Act, as a law, as a federal statute, and introduce you to it in that frame because I think that's the most helpful start for people to make sense of what the heck this is. People have heard so many different pieces, but lack a structure to try to help it make sense. So here is the Affordable Care Act. So just like you know, a book has chapters and a baseball game has innings, a federal law, a federal statute is composed of titles. That's what defines a law, a federal law. And the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, has 10 titles. And I'm gonna just walk through these really quickly so you can understand, but this is to give you a sense of the structure of what this is. 
So Title I is all about the regulation of private health insurance in the United States. If we get to January 1st, 2014, and nothing changes substantively, then private health insurance in the United States and health insurance generally in the United States will never be the same. It is a fundamental, thorough revolution. It doesn't replace private health insurance, though it fundamentally changes the structure, and many of those changes are already well underway. All right, so that's Title I. Title II is all things about Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program. This was written to be a thorough and significant revolution in Medicaid for low-income Americans. Because of the US Supreme Court decision in June of 2012, it will only be a partial revolution in those states which choose to adopt it. Because the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, made the Medicaid expansion a state option and the law was not written that way. So it will be a partial revolution in the states that embrace it. Title III is all about Medicare and about reforming the medical care delivery system in the United States to move it away from a fee-for-service structure and to move toward more accountable forms of payment and financing. It is not a revolution. It is a hoped-for revolution. It is the planting of seeds and shrubs and small trees that are hoped to grow into what will resemble a revolution in the years to come. Title IV is all things about prevention, wellness, and public health. It is not a revolution, and it is also at the same time probably one of the most ambitious sets of public health prevention and wellness reforms in the nation's history. Title V is all about the healthcare workforce. It is also not a revolution, although again, it is one of the broadest set of workforce reforms that we've seen. Title VI is a little bit of a grab bag, fraud and abuse, transparency, something called the Elder Justice Act, and a number of other things, including the creation of a federal institute on, on comparative effectiveness research. Um, no particular revolutions there, a lot of solid policy advances. Title VI is all about the pharmaceutical industry, and in particular the biopharmaceutical industry, for the first time allowing our Food and Drug Administration to create a regulatory pathway to permit the manufacture, marketing, and sale of so-called biosimilars, which is like generic-like version of biopharmaceutical drugs, which is the future and growth of the drug industry in the United States. That is well underway. Title VIII is something known as CLASS, Community Living Assistance Services and Supports. It was the personal priority of my boss, the late Senator Edward Kennedy. One of the most important things for him in inclusion to create a new support system, income support system for Americans who are temporarily or permanently disabled. And there's a line through it because this past January 1st, Title VIII was repealed by Congress in toto, and that repeal was signed by the President, so there is no longer a Title VIII. Title IX are revenue measures to pay for a le slightly less than half the cost of this law. And Title X is something that I shouldn't even include, but I need to. It's called the Manager's Amendment in technical terms, and all it is consisting of is amendments to Titles I through IX. And you might ask, why didn't they just fold those in? And that's a great question, and that would take longer than I have to answer, and it reflects the peculiar and unprecedented legislative process by which the Affordable Care Act became <coughs> law. So what you see here, Titles 1 through 10, is known collectively as the PPACA, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was signed on March 23rd into law by President Obama. And about a week later, the President signed a follow-up piece of legislation into law, which was known as the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act. That law was largely composed of amendments to Titles I through X in PPOC. So 
when you wonder why do they call it ACA instead of the PPACA, there is actually a logical explanation. PPACA refers to titles 1 through 10, and ACA is used to refer to the entire PPACA as amended by the HCERA. So you understand, there's a logic to ACA because PPACA refers to something actually distinct, and that difference matters to almost nobody except for <laughs> lawyers who do this, but that is, the, that is the story. So if you look at these 10 titles collectively, what you see is the only time in our nation's history when Congress has passed a law which could be referred to as close to comprehensive health reform. Comprehensive in the sense that it addresses access, quality, and costs, in the sense that it addresses Medicare, Medicaid, private health insurance. There's almost no part of our health system in the United States that is not affected in some significant way by the Affordable Care Act. If you think back to the only federal law which you could hold it up to in comparison, that would be the 1965 law that created Medicare and Medicaid. If you think about that law, it was certainly big at the time. It has certainly been of monumental importance in the years since then. But the original law created coverage for senior citizens and it created, through Medicare, and it created coverage for low-income families on public assistance administered through states. And that was all that it did. So the scope, the breadth, and the ambition of the ACA, whether you like it or dislike it, is undeniably unique in American legislative history. And this is as close as we've ever gotten to comprehensive reform. Not nearly far enough for many, many Americans, not nearly far enough for me as well. I would readily agree to that. But this is about as far as we've ever gotten in the history of the country. And if you look at any provision in this law, any provision, what you will find are you will find numerous highly informed, intelligent commentators who will tell you how short these came from what ought to have been done. And again, probably about 90% of the time, I would agree. While I would also say that this was about as far as we could imagine Congress going in 2009 and 2010, and certainly passage of anything like it now in the current political environment is absolutely inconceivable. It will take another major shift in terms of political control to see anything of this scope get anywhere on the political radar screen. Okay? So that's it, so if you see this, so private insurance, Medicaid, Medicare delivery system reform, prevention, workforce, and the others. I'm gonna talk just in a little bit more detail about titles one through five. I would talk about the others if I had time, but I don't, and so if you wanna know about them, you can ask questions about them. <coughs> so let's talk about title one. Most of what you've heard about the ACA involves title one. It is often said that what was done in the Affordable Care Act was based upon what Massachusetts did in 2006 in its health reform law. And that is both true and false. It is true as it pertains to Title I. It is false because there's nothing in Massachusetts health reform that resembles Titles II through X and the AC and the HCERA. So Massachusetts provided the conceptual model for Title I of the ACA and nothing else. So what is Title I? There's two big pieces. There were a series of immediate reforms that were implemented in 2010 and 2011. And then there were the more fundamental reforms that set the stage for what's coming on January 1st. So the immediate reforms, you've probably heard bits and pieces about these include allowing young adults up to age 26 to stay on their parents' health insurance plan, eliminating lifetime and annual benefit limits in private health insurance policies in the United States, regulating something called medical loss ratios, which require all health insurance plans to spend at least 80 or 85 cents of every premium dollar on pure medical costs as opposed to profits, marketing, bureaucracy, other kinds of things. Closing the Medicare Part D donut hole. All of these things 
are going on and have been largely accomplished. If the ACA did nothing but these immediate reforms, people would say this was a highly significant set of reforms, and this is only the appetizer for what is to come. The big part comes in next January, on January 1st, when a set of reforms happens that is fundamental. So the first one is significant reform of private health insurance regulation, in particular to outlaw a practice known as medical underwriting, by which health insurers make the decision to write you a policy or not based upon your prior medical history. If you have diabetes, asthma, you ever been to a psychiatrist, you've had any kind of medical episode, you have to report these and the insurer has the complete discretion to decide whether to write you a policy and under what terms. So they might write you a policy that would cover everything except your diabetes. They might write you a policy, but you will pay three times as high as anyone else in premiums. This is the law of the states in 45 of the 50 states today. And beginning next January, medical underwriting and the imposition of pre-existing condition exclusions is banned in all health insurance policies in the United States. And instead, we have a new regulatory regime that is referred to as guaranteed issue. That has been true in Massachusetts since the 1990s, which is why you're not gonna see a big change here in Massachusetts. In the rest of those 45 states, this is fundamental. This is enormous and significant. Number two, because there's a problem with guaranteed issue which, when you do it alone. When you do guaranteed issue alone, you will have a number of people, a significant number of particularly young and healthier people who will wait until they get sick before they buy health insurance. And it will then shoot up premiums for everybody else because older people and people with chronic conditions will dive into getting coverage. And you create an insurance death spiral. And so the way we mitigate against that is by imposing individual responsibility, which tends to be known as the individual mandate. And we've had that in Massachusetts since 2007. And then the third piece to make the purchase of insurance affordable for people who would be ma mandated to buy it are premium and cost sharing subsidies to make the cost of insurance affordable along the way. And then the last piece is something called state health insurance exchanges. Again, we've had one in Massachusetts since 2006. It's called the Massachusetts Health Insurance Connector Authority. You can go online, just Google Massachusetts Connector, it will come right in. You can actually do a test drive even if you're not looking to buy insurance to see how it goes. It's basically a travelocity and Expedia for health insurance that enables you to do apples to apples comparisons and be able to purchase. My son spent a year in Thailand, he came back, he needed health insurance, we went on the connector and it took us about 10 minutes to buy him a health insurance policy, soup to nuts. It makes it easy, it makes it far easier than it might otherwise be. It's never easy, but it makes it far easier. These are the fundamental parts that will come into play on uh, January 1st of this year. Um, just in terms of where, where are we at, there are different options for states. States are allowed to set up and manage their own health insurance exchanges, also known as health insurance marketplaces. And states are allowed, and those are the blue states, the dark blue states. States are allowed to share responsibility with the federal government. Those are the light blue states. And states are allowed to say, no, we won't do it. And the federal government then comes in and does it themselves, which is what's happening in about 26 of the states. Although these numbers, states are continuing to make up their minds and adjust on the margin. So uh, the irony of this, of course, is that uh, in the legislative process, Progressive Democrats, including the majority of the House of Representatives, wanted just to have one big federal exchange. And it was conservative and moderate Democrats and Republicans who insisted that we have to have states' rights and have states have the ability to decide if they wanted to do it or not. And ironically, it is the conservative and uh, Republican-leaning states who have all decided en masse, no, we will not do it. We will let the federal government do it because we want nothing to do with Obama. Okay. That's Title I, okay? Let's talk about Title II. So Title II deals with Medicaid. 
Medicaid is known and recognized as health insurance for low-income Americans. And it is, although it has never been health insurance for all low-income Americans. It's been health insurance for low-income Americans who fit into the categories that states choose to allow into their programs. There are some federal mandates, so states have to cover all poor children up to 100% of the federal poverty line. But for the most part, states have broad discretion in who else they cover. So there are some states, like Massachusetts, that provided broad coverage under its Medicaid program for a long period of time in many states where there where many, many low-income people, people with no economic resources, have never been eligible for Medicaid. And so the Affordable Care Act in Title II established a national eligibility floor that everybody who can't get health insurance elsewhere, through a private employer or elsewhere, who has an income below 138% of the federal poverty line, beginning next January, would be guaranteed the right to enroll in their state Medicaid program. And that was challenged before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that the Medicaid expansion in the ACA had to be implemented as an option for states. So for the past 15 months now, we have had this extraordinary process unfolding in states trying to decide whether to expand Medicaid or not. Um, this is the map. As of just a couple of weeks ago, you may have heard Michigan decided that they were going to expand their Medicaid program under the ACA. Other states are still trying to make up their minds. So the irony, the irony of the Supreme Court decision is that beginning next January 1, <laughs> There is now a structure in place in the United States where every citizen and legally residing immigrant will have some form of coverage guaranteed for them, except for low-income individuals who live in states that have chosen not to expand their Medicaid coverage. So uh, we, we, uh, we heard all along the process of passing this law that we were implementing <coughs> rationing it was never true. Uh, what we have under the Supreme Court amended version of the ACA is the most insidious form of rationing imaginable. The only people without guaranteed access are low-income Americans who live in those states that you see in red. Okay. So this is how the structure works under Title I and Title II together. So if you have an income below 138% of poverty, which is about 31,000 in household income for a family of four, you can join your state Medicaid program if the state chooses to adopt the Medicaid expansion. If you have an income above that and you can't get health insurance through an employer or another source, then you can go to your state insurance exchange or marketplace and you can buy coverage there. If your income is between 139 and 400% of poverty, four times poverty, then you are eligible for subsidies to enable you to be able to afford the cost of the premiums and to control and limit the cost sharing subsidies in those plans. If you're over four times poverty and you can't get health insurance anywhere, and there are some, not a huge amount, but there are some of those folks, you can go to your exchange and buy guaranteed coverage, although you pay the full cost of the premiums. Okay? So that's the structure, one, two, three, in terms of how it goes. Now, if you're in a state that, like Texas, that is not expanding their Medicaid program, you can actually get into the exchange if you have an income above 100% of the federal poverty line. But if you are below 100% in Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, the other states that are not expanding, and you're under the 100% of the poverty line, you're out of luck. So that's Title I and Title II. We'll talk a little bit about Title III. Title III does two things, two major pieces. One is changes to the Medicare program. I see a lot of people in this room who I have a hunch around Medicare. <laughs> so I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, so, and, uh, and the changes uh, <coughs> fall in two directions. One is changes in the benefits. So closing the prescription drug Part D donut hole. Um, uh, 
providing uh, preventive, clinical preventive services approved by the federal government with zero cost sharing, uh, allowing an annual wellness exam, uh, no other changes to benefits or eligibility at all impacting enrollees. And then a series of changes to the payment structure to hospitals, health plans, other providers with the exceptions of physicians that were designed to lower the rate of growth of Medicare spending to pay for roughly about 40% of the cost of the loan. Most of those changes are already well being implemented. For example, the hospital industry made an agreement with the Senate and with the White House during the political process to lower the rate of growth of hospital spending over 10 years by about $155 billion. Why on earth would hospitals agree to give up $155 billion? Because their financial experts told them that if we got coverage up to the level anticipated by the ACA, they would see economic benefits exceeding $200 billion. So they saw they would take a loss and they would take a benefit and it would create a more durable structure that took them significantly off the hook for being the place where people got mad when they didn't have insurance and they couldn't pay their bills. The second set of changes are changes designed to try to improve the quality, efficiency, and effectiveness of medical care delivery in the United States. Americans are divided. If you ask Americans, do we have the highest quality health care in the world? It's significantly skewed by Republicans, about 40% of Americans say yes. If you ask, and, and, and the people who say no, significantly skewed by Democrats, about 50% will say no, we don't. But Americans are divided. But if you look at the actual data, it is pretty indisputable that particularly for the money that we spend on health medical care services in the United States, we get a raw deal. If you look at the measures of quality, efficiency, and effectiveness in our system, we have staggering problems in terms of, qual of quality of care. The only thing we are really exceptionally good at in medical care delivering the United States is spending far more money than any other system on the planet. So for every dollar we spend in the United States, the second most expensive system, which kind of bounces among Switzerland, Norway, Germany, the second most expensive system spends about 65 cents on the dollar for what we spend. And all of the advanced nations except the United States cover all their citizens and have quality measures that are at least equal and in most cases superior to the outcomes that we deliver. So members of the Senate and the House, Republican and Democrat, knew this data, knew this analysis, understood this, and recognized at the start of the process creating the law that if the law did not address these staggering problems in quality and efficiency and effectiveness, then we were missing an important responsibility. And so Title III is where you will find most of those efforts. They involve new terms, new concepts, new ideas, things like accountable care organizations. There's a national quality strategy that you can read online. Just Google national quality strategy and you can get it. Things called patient-centered medical homes. Penalties on hospitals that have excessively high rates of hospital readmissions. Medicare patients who get discharged and return back for the same condition within 30 days penalties on hospitals with high rates of hospital-acquired infections, and many, many more. None of these were done with the assurance that this is going to work and this is going to give us the outcome we want. But in truth, nobody had the magic bullet. No one had the magic solution for how to do this. And so what was done in the ACA was taking as many ideas as people could advance that could pass political muster and putting them for the most part in Title III. And what I would suggest to you is that over the past, over the past three and a half years, what we are seeing right now is in to my way, I've been paying attention to healthcare policy in the United States 
since about 1985. And what we've been seeing over the past three years is probably the most robust period of experimentation with improving the quality, efficiency, and effectiveness of medical care than we have ever seen in the history of our nation's healthcare system. Arguably, there's too much going on right now. There are too many experiments going on all at once. But this is an extraordinarily dynamic period. Let me just show you one chart. This, this is one chart that shows just the extent of four of the significant kinds of reforms that are being experimented, not just in the public sector, but also in the private sector. One of the key pieces in Title III is something called accountable care organizations, which represents the concept of reform that says that we need to move away from a system which is based on fee-for-service reimbursement, which rewards providers based upon the quantity and not the quality or the value of the services that they perform. And so ACOs are meant to create new organizational structures where the providers themselves will feel not just I'm rewarded by how much I do, but I'm rewarded for how well I do through global payment and other kinds of mechanisms. When the law was signed, people said, well, this is like, this is like a unicorn. I mean, we can imagine it in theory, but it doesn't exist anywhere. Right now in the Medicare program, we have over 250 ACOs now working, including a large number here in Massachusetts. We still don't know, is this going to work? Is this going to be a gigantic success? We just don't know. But what's going on right now is frankly just an extraordinarily dynamic period in providers, insurers, public, private, at all levels of the system trying to figure out how can we make this system work better for patients, how can we make it work better in terms of providing better <coughs> value for what we do. Okay? So lots more going on. I'm just giving you the headline. Title, title IV, Prevention and Wellness. Um, are my, my, my friends in, in, in the American Public Health Association could tell me 500 ways that this title could have been better, and it is still probably one of the most significant public health titles that's ever been done. Creation of a Prevention and Wellness Commission, creation of a National Prevention Strategy. Uh, I, I welcome you to Google National Prevention Strategy and look at what was put together by the commission chaired by the former Surgeon General Regina Benjamin, who did a fantastic job of creating a blueprint for reform that is being used not just at the federal level, but by states, counties, and localities all over the country. A prevention and wellness <coughs> trust to begin to invest in prevention up front with $15 billion in guarantee. Unfortunately, Congress swiped about $5 billion of that back in part of the budget deals. Coverage of all clinical preventive services graded by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Forces A or B, meaning that they are evidence-based that they actually <laughs> work. And so all public and private health insurance policies in Medicare and private health insurance have to cover these services beginning in 2010 with no cost sharing at all. And also something coming probably next year, calorie labeling in chain restaurants, which is a whole other story unto itself. A lot more to say. Title V, the healthcare workforce, money for primary care expansions, big increases in funding for community health centers, and the National Health Service Corps, creation of a National Workforce Commission and a National Workforce Plan and Strategy. A sad story here. <coughs> Nobody, Republican or Democrat, disagreed with what was in this title. And everybody agreed that a National Workforce Commission made sense. And so when the law was signed, the Comptroller General of the Government Accountability Office of GAO was tasked with appointing the members of the commission and getting enrolled. And in the fall of 2010, he did it. He appointed a fantastic panel, no government people, all outside workforce experts, to begin to do a national workforce plan and put together <coughs> a strategy with recommendations to Congress, the administration, states, and to continually monitor an ongoing basis what our workforce needs were. Appointed in 2010, yet to have its first meeting because the Republican-controlled House of Representatives refuses to appropriate the couple of million dollars that would allow it to get going. The members who were appointed are even legally prohibited from having telephone conversations with each other. They have no communications at all. 
So just a real tragedy and missed opportunity. Title VI, a lot here to talk about, but I'm running out of time. So I'm going to go. I want, to, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. This is, uh, this is the finances. This is the money behind the ACA so you can see it and understand it and grasp it a little bit because it's important. Uh, sometimes I think that the, the color of the blood that courses through the veins of our healthcare system is green because it's all about money. That's what makes this thing go. And so this is the ACA in money terms. These are the financing estimates put together by the Congressional Budget Office, which is the nonpartisan budget referee for legislation coming through Congress, and what they estimated. And so what you can see over on the left are the top nine titles of the law, right? You've got them all memorized now. You're never going to forget, right? If I ask you what's Title V, you're going to know, right? Workforce. What's Title III? Delivery system. What's Title VIII? Class, but it's not around it. You're, you're never going to forget this, right? For the rest of your life. So here it is, okay? You understand. You've got the structure to understand this, okay? So you move to the next problem co undercover. So the estimates of the CBO, this was when the law was signed in the spring of 2010, were that about 16 million uninsured Americans would get covered through Title I, through the health insurance exchanges and marketplaces, <coughs> and 16 million would get covered under Title II, the Medicaid expansion. <laughs> That has changed significantly because of the Supreme Court decision. So there'll be a lot fewer people under Title II, maybe about 11 or 12 million will get into Medicaid and it might be, it will take, it will take time. It will take time, uh, but it will get there. And then there'll be more people going into the private coverage under Title I. So up we're around 19 million. So a net loss of, uh, of about 3 million in terms of who's gonna get covered because of it. So the next column shows you where is the money spent under this law, okay? Because it's worth understanding. And what you can see under this, and again, this is 10 years, 2010 to 2019, because that's how the CBO does their scoring. And if you did it today, you would do it, of course, 2014 through 2023. All the numbers would be higher, but the rough equivalencies pretty much stay the same, all right? So what you can see under where the money is spent is that overwhelmingly the money on the ACA is spent under Title I and Title II to pay for coverage. The $54 billion in Title III is mostly the cost of closing the Medicare prescription drug donut hole. But so overwhelmingly, the money that's spent in this law goes to expanding health insurance coverage, public and private. Then let's look at that last column on the right, and that's where the money is gotten from. That's where the money is raised because the Affordable Care Act was, in spite of what many Americans believe, a totally self-financed law in the sense that as it, as it created financial obligations for the federal government in expanding coverage, it also raised money so that the net impact of the law would actually be to reduce the federal budget deficit by about $120 billion over 10 years, which in federal budget terms is not a lot of money, but it is far better than adding to the deficit. And just to give you a comparison, the last major health reform law was in 2003, and that was the creation of the Medicare Part D drug program in a law called the Medicare Modernization Act. You may remember when President Bush take, take, took credit for creating for the first time a prescription drug program for seniors in Medicare, and he did it. Now, if you put the Medicare Modernization Act up here in a chart like this, you would have the sections, you would have the number of people who get prescription drug coverage, you'd have where the money's spent, and then you know what you'd have in that last column? About 25% of the cost of that law is raised by premiums paid by Medicare enrollees to get this coverage, the other 75% is all put on the federal debt, the federal deficit. It was deficit financed, okay? So that over this period, 2010 to 2019, the ACA will lower the federal deficit by about $120 billion. And by the way, the Medicare Modernization Act over that same period will increase the federal debt by over a trillion dollars. Okay, so tell me which way is the right way. But what you can see if you look at that last column is you can see where the money's raised. And so the money is raised through the reductions in the rate of growth 
in the Medicare program. That's Title III. That's title, that's the hospital cuts, cuts to private health insurers, home health, even hospices took a cut. Everybody took a cut with the exception of physicians, okay? And then the last piece, you could, the other big piece is Title IX, the revenues, again, to pay for roughly about 40% of the cost of the law. That is new payroll taxes on high income earners, namely individuals making more than 200 grand a year, families, couples making more than 250 grand a year, new Medicare payroll taxes on them, on the increments above, on the income increments above 200 or 250 respectively. There are new taxes on the drug industry, there are new taxes on the medical device industry, there are taxes on the pharmaceutical <coughs> industry, all part of Title IX. I'll just mention one thing because people usually get entertained by this. Originally, in the original Senate version of the ACA of the PIPACA, there was a tax on elective cosmetic surgery that was popularly, or I might say unpopularly known as the Botox. <laughs> <laughs> and it got a lot of flack when it came out from, dare I say, older women consumers, and particularly the American Society of Dermatologists. And because of that, at the, the, the uproar was so large that at the last minute, the Botox was put out and put in its place was a tax on indoor tanning services of 10%, which if you think about it, may actually be the most important public health innovation in this entire law. If you know anything about the absolutely stunning and shocking increase in skin cancer, including melanoma, among young women between ages 15 and 35, which is significantly attributed to their use of indoor tanning services. So this is the money. Let me close up, okay? Um, so, by the way, there's been a fair amount that has changed in the ACA. Not as much as some people would like to see, including people who would like to see it all gone. But the law has not, been in, has not been untouched. And I list here what I regard as the eight most significant changes in the law. And these are all with the exception of the fourth one, the Medicaid expansion, which was done by the Supreme Court. All of these changes were done by Congress in various measures over the past three and a half years. Okay? So just some summary judgments and looking ahead. So by my count, the Affordable Care Act and US health reform has survived three near-death experiences. The first came on January 19, 2010, <coughs> when the US Senate seat formerly held by Senator Kennedy was won by Scott Brown. Democrats lost their 60 seat filibuster-proof majority in the Senate and had to go through one of the most unusual legislative processes ever seen for a major piece of legislation to get done. Many people, when Scott Brown was elected, said, it's all over, forget it, why are you wasting your time? They were wrong. That was number one. Number two was the US Supreme Court. Worth remembering that after they heard the oral arguments, there were five votes five votes on the Supreme Court to throw out the entire law, the entire law, and John Roberts, the Chief Justice, had a change of mind and went and wrote a peculiar middle ground position which did the Medicaid state option and some other changes, but largely left the essential structure untouched. <clears throat> Survived that by a whisker. And then, of course, the third near-death experience was the 2010 federal elections. Had Mitt Romney been elected president and had the Republicans taken a majority in the Senate, the ACA by now would already have been repealed through budget reconciliation rules. So we've survived three, and by my count, the, the worst is over. The worst is over, and most of what's going on right now are the, the death throes of the opposition. Um, it, is, it is interesting how, how insistent they are at this point the opposition to the law in trying to prevent it from being implemented. And my theory is they are not afraid of what will happen if the law is implemented. They are afraid of how they will be viewed when the law is implemented and it is not the end of health care in America as we have known it. 